Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation, uh, Tragic True Life Tales, Unusual Deaths as Reported in Local Newspapers 100 Years Ago. Um, my name is Matt. I'm the local history librarian here at Moffitt Library, and tonight we're, we're, we're pleased and honored to have as my co-host, uh, Jill Lemaster moore um, We are also simulcasting this, so uh, we do have nine participants who are watching um, virtually. Um, just so everybody is aware, um, and, and also I want to thank David, uh, our co-host, uh, our, our, and our other librarian here at Moffitt Library uh, for facilitating that. Um, if there are issues technically uh, beyond our control, don't worry, we're still recording on this computer uh, and we'll be uploading the video to our YouTube channel. If you go to youtube.com, you type Moffitt Library, we're usually one of the top hits there. Um, pro hint, we found this out uh, becoming kind of, um, kind of fly by night YouTube influencers ourselves. Um, if you, we get at least 100 people to subscribe to our channel, we could actually get a URL that people will remember. Uh, to go to. So uh, we have 56 subscribers right now. So feel free to sign your friends up uh, and get them involved as well. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, let Jill take over and um, have the floor. Thanks. Okay. So, okay, is it still in presenter mode? Yes. Okay. Let's go. Not there we go. Ooh. Ooh. Not yet. <laughs> oh, sneak preview. Yeah, there we go. So, <laughs> so, 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 so these two right here. Okay. All right. There we go. So before I begin, uh, we wanted to say that this series is dedicated, all the history programming that we are doing has been dedicated to the memory of Linda Standish, who was the village historian who passed away in January of this year. Um, and these are some of the pictures that I've had of Linda at different various events that we did throughout the year. And um, she was a real gem to the community and we miss her every day. So my name is Jill Master Moore. Um, and I wear many hats around town <laughs> and around the community in all of Orange County, really. I am a, the chapter, well, I was the chapter registrar for the Quisaic chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution. Um, I work for and with the uh, Washingtonville Cemetery. Um, I am also a professional headstone cleaner. I am a genealogist by profession. And in my past, I lived above a funeral home <laughs> where, I, where I worked. And so I have a very unique perspective when it comes to talking about dead people. And a lot of people are very uncomfortable when it comes to talking about dead people and they kind of get squeamish. And uh, when we were approaching this topic, it, it's kind of weird. People in my genealogy club, I taught genealogy club here at the Moffitt and I still do, we still meet. Um, people were kind of like leery about, you know, discussing people of the past. And I just want to say, as we approach this topic, we don't do it lightly. We don't do it in a funny manner. We're not making fun of the ways they died or making light of it, but we kind of in respect, you know, that we have for the ways that they died and the lack of medicine that they had and the ones who did make it. I, I mean, I look back at my Patriot in the DAR and I think, oh my gosh, it only took one bullet and I wouldn't be here because that whole line would be wiped out. I think of my dad in Vietnam who got five Purple Hearts, one of those, and I wouldn't be here because um, I was born after he came back from Vietnam. So when I think about these people um, and what could have been, you know, had they lived, how different, you know, the community might have been, you know, had somebody lived a little bit further um, and how their descendants' lives. So that's what the reverence that I approach this topic. And when I think about the children who lived through these eras, um, you know, they were used to going out and help dig graves for their grandparents or their parents or their brothers or sisters, especially like when yellow fever came through or, you know, any of the other typhoid, take your pick, whatever it was, they were used to talking about death. And today it's still kind of taboo. And, you know, people approach this death is very much different for us than it was for them. It was very real and it was in your face. Um, so that's the, I grew up with it. So I'm not as squeamish about it, I think, as opposed to some of you might be, but I hope at the end, maybe you'll see that you know, we try to approach this respectfully. So um, most of the people, well, almost all of the people I'll be talking about came from the Washingtonville Cemetery. And tonight we're going to talk about my fifth cousin, which is very strange to say that I have a fifth cousin because I'm from Ohio <laughs> and I moved here 
with the military when my husband uh, <laughs> when my husband joined the military, uh, they moved us out here to West Point and my family tree exploded about that time. And I realized that I'm related to the Strongs, the Woodhalls, the Howes, the Brewsters, the Tuthills. And I discovered this lovely lady not too long ago. Her name is, um, can I have one light on? I can't see, sorry. Um, I need to read my notes because we'll go down rabbit holes and we'll be here all night if I start talking. <laughs> so I have to stick to my notes, I'm sorry. Uh, this lovely lady here is Ann Howard Tuthill. She was 28 years old and the daughter of James and Hulda Brewster Tuthill. Uh, the Tuthills have really long roots going back to New York. Her grandfathers, both of them, served in the fourth New York during the revolution and were some of the longstanding farming families here in Orange County. She had been living and working as a principal in Brooklyn at the public school number 12, where she met a young man from Williamsburg who also happened to serve on the board of education there. And shortly thereafter, as it does happen, they were uh, fated to fall in love and they got engaged. On January 17th of 1860, she spent the night at her sister's house in Kingston and she was going to be married the following day. On the morning of the 18th, the bridal party began to make their way to the Second Reformed Church of Kingston. It was born in 1850, and that's where that picture is from. And so you will see the church looked pretty much as she would have seen it that day. Four gentlemen of the party were able to get were unable to get seats in the sled and had to walk instead. Anna's niece remarked that they looked more like pallbearers instead of wedding guests. I don't know why she just made that comment. <laughs> um, everyone having made their way to the church finally. Anna and Thomas were married at 10 o'clock at the Second Reformed Church in front of a small gathering of friends and family. With the happy ceremony complete, the couple and the bridal party set out across the ice on the river to the train station where they boarded the train back to Brooklyn and took seats at the rear of the train. There were so many articles and a lawsuit and an inquest that described the next series of events that I couldn't put them all on the screen. I mean, there were just pages and pages. So I'm gonna summarize what happened. The train breaks down as they're leaving Kingston and they're heading towards Terrytown. Um, but as it breaks down, not once, not twice, but three times it breaks down. And as it breaks down, people get off the train and they're, because they're sitting there for a long time. It's the winter, they're getting out, they're making snowballs, they're having snowball fights. I'm, maybe they were making snow angels, I don't know. I, I heard snowball <laughs> fights. Um, they're watching the guys making repairs. But on the third time, Anna decides not to get off. I mean, she's in her nice dress. It's cold. She stays in the rear of the train in her car. And um, as they're sitting there, much to their horror, they hear a train coming up from behind. And before they know it, the train barrels down and hits the back of the train, taking Anna with it. The train car splinters and Anna goes flying forward, stuck to the boiler of the train. And when I say that she is stuck to the boiler, I mean it. She's pinned there. Her dress melts and her skin melts to the boiler of the train. Thomas and her friends rush to find her when the train finally comes to a stop. They're pulling the debris off and they find her. Both of her legs are badly broken and her dress, like I said, is melted. They had to cut her free from the boiler. She's somehow still alive. And she tells Thomas as he's holding her, she says, I will not live the day. Luckily for Thomas and Ann, the locomotive of their train at the, far, at the far end was undamaged, as was some of the front cars. They put the injured people, because there were several other who's, who were injured but still alive, um, they put those at the front cars and they took them to the next stop on the rail line, which was Yonkers. And they took Anna to the Gomez house, which is pictured here, and they called for the doctor. Um, she breathed her last breath around seven o'clock. So literally she was married and dead on the same day and it says that on her head, to, on her tombstone there, it says married and dead. So um, Thomas, for his part, was just totally bereft. And he sued the railroad company and won his case. Um, but he had a real hard time of it. The lawyers for the railroad company tried to argue that his case should be dismissed because he truly wasn't her next of kin, as they hadn't been married long enough. And the judge dismissed it and said that's basically bull crap because they were married that morning. Um, so Thomas did win $3,700, which would be the equivalent of $132,000 today. So, all right, so that's the poor tale of Anne. <laughs> um, and while this, Im this image I find very funny, um, 
not because it, but, but I find it very funny because these women they're making fun of in the London newspapers uh, because of the impossibly large dresses that these women would wear to balls. And I'm sure you've seen it in different movies and stuff like that. These women wear these huge dresses and have to go sideways through the doors. Um, but it belies another deadly issue as well. Hidden beneath those dresses were layers of deadly crinoline and netting, which were highly flammable and would go up quickly if they caught fire. And it gave people little time to react at all. And this is another famous couple of images here. Um, as gas lights were placed low um, on stage to illuminate the dancers' legs, ballerinas' legs, um, for better viewing if you were out in the crowd because it lit up their legs, you know, they would wear the tights and it would kind of make them glow. Uh, ballerinas were especially susceptible to catching fire and it did happen. The lady on the right here is Emma Levery and she was a well-known French ballerina who died of severe burns when her dress caught fire on stage. And she ran back and forth three times before they were able to catch her and put her out. And because she was, she was French, she was very modest, she clutched her burning dress to her chest and actually exacerbated the burns on her chest. And she lived, she lived for a couple months and she lingered and um, she died, her wounds went septic and she died at the age of 20. So she was a very famous um, ballerina for that. But the image on the left is probably even more horrible, <laughs> if you can imagine that. Um, there were seven dancers that were killed when one dancer caught fire and it spread to the other dancers' dresses because she was running around in a panic. This was in the dressing room of the Continental Theater in Philadelphia in 1861. That's to tell you how dangerous these dresses and crinoline could be. And so we move to my next person at the cemetery. If you were at the cemetery tour that we just did as part of Witchingtonville, you might have met Joanna. Um, she was one of our stops. And she is also my fifth cousin. <laughs> um, and she was also a member of the uh, DAR. Joanna B. Howe, while not a ballerina, um, su suffered a similar fate to the ballerinas, though, in August of 1930. Joanna was 69 years old and the last of her line. She was living in the home on the lands that her family had occupied since 1730. Her grandfathers served in the Revolutionary War, and she was very proud of their service, and she was a member of the Blooming Grove chapter of the DAR, which is now not around anymore. Um, she hosted meetings in that same house, and you can find her writing articles about her grandfathers and their service in the newspapers from this time frame. Um, on August 26th, Joanna was making lunch in the kitchen and had left her oil stove open the door and her dress brushed against it and she just went up like a candle. Um, and then hearing her screams, the farmhand that was working there heard her and came running inside, tried to put her out, but he caught flame himself and he was burned about the arms and the hands and he was severely burned. Um, the neighbor next door, whose name was Halleck, I'm not sure which one it is, I'm sure it's related to Russell who works with us at the cemetery, um, heard the commotion and came running and he was able to put the, both of them out, um, but she had been fatally burned about the abdomen, breast, face, and hands. The doctor came from town and stayed with her until the ambulance came and took her to St. Luke's, and she lingered there until three o'clock the next day, uh, bringing an end to six generations of Howells that had lived here in Washingtonville. So that was a very, her, neither her nor her brother had married, so that was the end of their line, and that house is no longer there. I was on Clove Road, you yeah. said? Yeah, Clove Road. And it's not there any long, but that was I, lingering in 1930. They probably didn't have the best medicines available to keep her comfortable. So it's probably quite agonizing. And then now we move to what I think is probably one of the more tragic tales out at Washingtonville. This is um, Anna Maria Place. And um, this is the place monument. It is four-sided. Um, because the stone is so degraded on the side, I wasn't able to get dates, so I began to search and research um, for obituaries on the place family to, to find out what dates was on there. Um, and I found this little tantalizing piece in the newspaper there about Anna died suddenly and mysterious, mysteriously. So I went down the rabbit hole on this one, <laughs> as one does. <laughs> um, so Anna was 15 years old. She was the daughter of Isaac Place and his wife, Rachel Electra Foster. Isaac was a well-to-do horse breeder and had a, he was a merchant here in town. I'm not sure what his business was, but just said merchant. Um, in April, 1874, Anna was living in Millbrook though with a cousin of her mother when she suddenly took ill and they called the doctor. But when the doctor arrived, the cousin's husband pulls the doctor to the side and says, we wanna keep this on the down low. So please don't go talking about it. 
doctor thought that was a little weird, but he's like, okay, whatever. So he goes upstairs to see Anna. He finds Anna in the middle of a very hard childbirth labor. She's 15 years old <laughs> in 1874. Um, she delivers the baby. It was healthy. It was a little boy named Lewis. Um, however, Anna didn't fare so well, and she became paralyzed on the left-hand side. And they said it was apoplexy, which you see here, pupural apoplexy, which means um, she was incapacitated from a cerebral hemorrhage or a stroke. And pupural, I cannot say that because I'm from Ohio and I can't say anything, uh, <laughs> means that it's the period relating to six weeks after childbirth. So she had the stroke after childbirth. Um, but essentially, she probably had a stroke from pushing too hard, the, the stress of it. Um, so she passes away two days later on April 6, 1874. And as terrible and tragic as you think that would be, it gets absolutely worse. And as happens in small towns, everyone knows everyone else's business. <laughs> uh, when Isaac brought her body back for burial from Millbrook, the townspeople start a gossiping, just as they do. Several articles point to where that she had a failed abortion, and that's how she died. However, when they learned that the baby had lived, well, the story then changes to they had sent her away because Isaac, the father, had an incestuous affair with her. And so that got tongues wagging. And uh, they were just absolutely incensed, and they sent a letter uh, there to the coroner demanding an inquest be performed. And they sent that to Coroner Wright in Newburgh, and he agreed, and he came out. And so he, he interviews Isaac Place. He doesn't put him on the stand in front of everybody. He goes to the father's house, and he takes his statement there. He's got the deputy coroner with him as well, the assistant deputy coroner as well. And the father gets up on in front of them and he's like look he's like i i don't know who the father is he said it could be anybody it could be one of the school boys and i do see her grades in the school in january of 1874 before she died she's at school you can see her listed with all the other boys in town you know so i know she was still here in school in 1874 before she goes to live in millbrook um he has a store and he has a boy working there who's 16 about the same age as her so it could be the boy he said but it's not me and he said but and this is, this is where it gets kind of touchy. He said, I, he says, I found out that she was in the family way. And I told her mother to approach her and find out who the father was. If the mother, find, if the mother had found out, she surely didn't let me know, which I think is weird. <laughs> and so um, he said, but he said, I have an idea of who I think it is. He said, but I haven't approached the man. He said, but I think I have an idea of who it is. He said, we were there the previous August uh, before she was pregnant, and now suddenly, now that she's pregnant, she wants to go back to Millbrook again. She really wants to go. So if you break out a calendar, which I did, and figure out August to April is nine months. So in a way, was he blaming the cousin's husband? You know, like she wanted to go back to, the, I, you could go either way with that. So was it a, a silent accusation towards the cousin's husband? We'll never know. Uh, but in any event, uh, the the father Isaac was cleared because there was no proof at all, but his and Anna's reputation was completely smeared in the eyes of the public. And um, Isaac did end up raising her son. His name was Lewis, and he's buried out there with them at the cemetery. He lived to a ripe old age of like 65, so he had a full life. But he didn't stay here in town. He he lived he lived in a, a New Jersey, so I can't blame him for moving if everybody was talking about your family and your mother. So. Let me flip my page here. So now we're going to talk about the tale of John Brooks. And it's one that I'm still trying to unravel at the cemetery. If you were at the tour or if you heard about the tour, this is another stop that we made as well. Um, this story is very long, so I'm going to summarize it because there's just page and page and page and page of documents. Um, you'll notice this monument says Captain, but all the articles that I'm going to show you say Colonel. I have yet to even find one military document for him, but they say he worked, he was in the War of 1812. I can't prove that yet. Just another mystery for my pile when I'm bored. <laughs> but um, anyways, the Brooke family were cattle and horse people, and Jonathan was described in many articles as a drover, meaning someone who drives cattle or sheep or, you know, he, he drives them, he moves them. So that might explain why he was in Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania when he was murdered in eight, June of 1828. Reportedly, Jonathan was on his way to purchase some cattle, and he comes across a small town on his route, and he stops for a bit, going into a few shops and businesses while he's there. He meets a vagrant named Truman Matthews, who basically decides that he's going to rob Jonathan. So he comes up with this plan. He asks Jonathan for a ride, 
and Jonathan being a generally, you know, nice fellow, he's like 52 years old, probably pretty trusting about this time because they don't really have murderers around, you know, I mean, Washingtonville surely doesn't have a lot of murders <laughs> in that time frame. Um, he's like, sure, yeah, hop in my, hop in my wagon, we're going to take a ride. So as they're about a mile out of town, the vagrant pretends that something is wrong with the wheel of the wagon, and Jonathan stops. Well, as soon as Jonathan gets out and starts looking at the wheel, the guy clubs him over the head with a rock. And he bashes him so ferociously, so many times over the head and the face, they could not identify Jonathan by his face. He was so mangled. He was, he was mutilated. And to make measures worse, to ensure that Jonathan was actually dead, he slit his throat as well. When he was done, he dragged him behind a boulder. So now that Jonathan is completely dead, he rides back into town. He takes all of Jonathan's belongings. He's got Jonathan's money, his gold pocket watch. He's got his horse's buggy. He's living the high life. He goes back into town and he goes into the hotel. However, when he gets back into town, the people, he goes into the businesses where Jonathan was and they recognize him because they saw Jonathan talking to him. And they're like, where's, where's, where's the guy you were just with? And the guy's really sketchy. And so they start to suspect that he's probably done something to him. This guy all of a sudden has a lot of money and has a gold watch. And he just looks really suspicious now. Truman Matthews is the man who, who did the murder, um, gets suspicious that they're starting to catch on. And he takes off. He jumps in the horse and buggy. He takes off running. Um, and the townspeople give chase. And thinking that he can ditch them out in the woods, he takes off on foot. He just dishes the horse buggy and takes off on foot thinking he'll lose them in the woods. <laughs> However, the townspeople were really incensed by this point. They circle the woods and they close ranks and they actually catch him and bring him back. They uh, take him in front of the corpse because they found Jonathan in this process. They found him behind the rock, bring him back to town and they bring Truman Matthews in front of Jonathan all laid out. They said, what do you have to say for yourself? And he says, he makes a handsome corpse, but I didn't do it. Just no remorse. No, no fear, no remorse, no, no contrition, no anything. So they throw him in jail. And as they're taking, they're putting him in jail, they're taking all his belongings off of him. They find Jonathan's gold watch. So they know that it's Jonathan's and they know that he's the one who did it. So um, anyways, they throw him in jail. And the article on the right there is a retrospective article that they're talking about. Um, somebody is remembering that when they hung Truman Matthews because he was convicted and he was, there's so many articles on this, this uh, hanging because it's only one of five hangings that ever happened in Wayne County, Pennsylvania. And people like have just talked about this forever. They just talked about it to death. Um, this person who's remembering saying, I was there. This is the largest congregation present that I had ever seen at that time in Pennsylvania. So, and they said they all cheered, amen, when he was hung. So it's uh, that's saying something there. Um, there was actually more found on Truman Matthews than I could find on Jonathan Brooks, which is very sad. But uh, Jonathan left me <laughs> with another puzzle because I found a much later art article, not that 1881 where they were saying amen, but this one was written in 1823 that now I'm questioning if Jonathan is even buried with me at all. Um, that last, <laughs> this really just throws everything into question. I just found this the other day as I was working on stuff for the tour at the cemetery. This article says, um, it mentions the funeral of Jonathan Brooks that took place there in Mount Pleasant and not in Washingtonville. Uh, we had assumed that his family brought him home. Um, it says that none of the Brooks family had made it to town as they really couldn't hold onto his body any longer because it was very hot in late June. And as there was no embalming or ice storage, um, they had to bury him for practical purposes. <laughs> I'm sure you know what I mean. Um, they decided to bury him and were about to start the service when two men were seen approaching. One being Jonathan's brother, John I. Brooks. Yes, there was John, Jonathan, and John. <laughs> um, and the Honorable Robert Denniston, which is surprising and interesting for me to see him make an appearance out there because uh, Robert Denniston is pretty well known around this area. Um, so that was interesting to see. Um, the article says they buried him in the family plot of General Samuel Meredith and says the dust of the two soldiers will thus remain close together until the son of man comes and the mossy old graves shall give up their dead. The mystery remains to me though, why didn't they bring him home if they were already right there? <laughs> I mean, they show up for a funeral, why didn't you just take him home with you then? Um, but perhaps they did it at a later date, I don't know. But the, the bigger mystery is according to other sources, nobody is buried there at General Meredith except his wife. So um, where's Jonathan then? <laughs> So I don't know, but if you go back two slides, Jonathan's date is wrong by a day and his 
title is wrong. He was a colonel, not a captain, accordingly. So maybe the family got it wrong when they did it later. I don't know. I'm still digging at that. I'm trying to get a hold of historical society <laughs> to find out, but he left me a mystery. So thanks, Jonathan. Um, this next tale is one of impetuous youth folly and all around bad decision making. Um, this story involves Charles Taylor Jr. and Robert Gilmore of Salisbury Mill, who both came to the Central Hotel on Main Street on Friday, May 19th, 1908, with a group of friends to play some pool. And boys being boys in a pool hall with liquor, what could possibly happen? As the night progressed, an argument broke out between the set, two sets of boys that were there and punches were thrown. Things eventually cooled and settled down, or so they thought. Uh, when Charles and his friend George Clouser went to leave, they headed back to the back of the stables to get their horse and buggy. And from the bushes, two men jumped out and yelled, who punched my friend? And Charles brazenly said, I did. The man lurched forward and stabbed Charles in the gut and then attacked his other friend and stabbed him in the back. Seeing the bleeding boys, um, the doctor was summoned, who happened to be Charles' brother, who was Matthew Du Bois. I cannot say that because I want to say Du Bois because I'm from Ohio. <laughs> and I know you guys say Du Bois, um, but who happened to be Charles' uh, brother-in-law. The doctor said, he's bleeding too profusely. I can't stop this. We've got to send him to St. Luke's. And so they did. The other boy that was stabbed in the back, they said it wasn't deep enough. He'll be, he'll be fine. But Charles was sent to recover. They said he should be fine unless sepsis sends in. Foreshadowing. So just keep that in mind. Anyhow, the attackers took off running, but uh, the patrons heard the commotion and took off after them. They were able to restrain them, and they, they called for the constable when he came. Um, Robert Gilmore and his half-brother, Walter Hurd, were captured and arrested. Um, but after they were caught, Gilmore said, I did the stabbing. My half-brother had nothing to do with it, and he was let go. They said he was innocent. Um, Gilmore was held. He was charged with first-degree assault, and he went before the judge telling the tale that Charles had actually kicked him, and that started the fight at the hotel. The judge made the comment, and you can see it on the right-hand side there, go to trial and fight for your liberty. The jury may find you not guilty if what I hear of your case is true. So just keep in mind that Charles, all this time, is resting at the hospital. And early on, it had said that Charles keeps comfortable and favorable, the outlook was favorable. But then suddenly on day 13, things take a dramatic turn for the worse. And then on day 14, they're like, it, his recovery is doubtful. So things start to really change. And on day 21, Charles did die from his wounds at St. Luke's. And Robert Gilmore was probably sitting in jail wondering what that meant for his future, because that's not assault at that point. Um, Charles was buried a few days later in a rather large service at our cemetery. He was a member of several large fraternities that came out and performed honors on his grave. And so I wondered what about Bob, because he, he actually went by Bob, not Robert. <laughs> um, so um, I wondered about his fate. So um, astoundingly, he must have felt some really bad guilt because he sat in jail all this time and did not ask for bail the whole entire time. He could have, he could have requested it, they could have denied him, but he didn't even ask for it. So he must have felt some kind of guilt for what happened to Charles. Um, but when Charles passed away, the newspapers printed an article that said that he would likely have that charge changed to homicide. And in early June, it was decided by the district attorney that they would just leave it up to the October grand jury to reindict him for manslaughter, in which it did. And that was reported on November 11th. So Robert was eventually sentenced to the Elmira Reformatory, which was the first reformatory in the United States. And if you've ever done any research into prisons in the United States, and especially within New York City or New York State, you'll know that uh, Elmira was full of all kinds of scandals and hideous abuse and uh, controversies. And Robert likely had a very, very hard time of it there. Um, both families suffered terribly in this tale. The Taylors lost their son, but the Gilmores probably likely never got the son back that they once knew before, once he got released. So when you're at cemeteries in Cape Cod, in other seafaring areas, um, you expect to see headstones like these that say lost at sea or shipwrecked, um, but you never expect to see them in the middle, middle of Washingtonville per se, would you? But we have one. <laughs> in plot 87, there's an obelisk. It's either unfinished or broken. It's kind of chopped off right in the middle. Um, you almost miss it if you're just walking by because it's very kind of faded. It, you see it's just kind of, it's hard to read. James Arbuckle there, it says, uh, J.M. Duncan Arbuckle lost at sea. 
Um, so of course I had to know the story on that one. So what in the world is this doing in Washington? Um, James Arbuckle was the son of Reverend James Arbuckle of the Scots Associated Reformed Church in Philadelphia. That's a mouthful, uh, which became attached later to the Presbyterian Church. The Reverend came to Blooming Grove in 1824 to be the pastor there until his death until 1847. In addition to James, they also had four um, girls who all married uh, pastors as well. So I know that was kind of interesting. Um, James was kind of hard to track down. He doesn't appear in many traditional records uh, because he died so early. Um, so he doesn't appear in a lot of censuses. He doesn't apply, you know, appear. He doesn't get married, so he doesn't have any marriage records. There's no <laughs> baptism records for him. So he's just kind of a ghost until this. Um, most of his details of his life came from his mother's obituary, oddly. Um, but we do know that he worked as a merchant in Folsom County, California, and he boarded the ship, this ship here, the Queen of the Isles in San Francisco, boarded, uh, bound for Mexico on September 15th, 1861. The Queen of the Isle was once an extremely quick wooden paddle steamer ship, uh, reported to be the fastest vessel in the Irish Seas in her day. She was a very reliable and stable workhorse and ran mail back and forth in addition to passengers. In 1845, her engine was ripped out and was given to a new ship. She was converted to a full sailing rig, just like this one pictured here, and was sold to Jay, Mith Jay Mitchell in the United States to be used as a passenger and goods transport ship. So James, like I said, did board the Queen of Isles in September, and he was never heard from again. In December, the newspapers out west started reporting that his ship was missing and had never returned back to port. And by January, the grim news made its way to New York to his friends and family that he was lost at sea, and no further detail was able to be provided to comfort them. They just had no, no shipwreck was ever found, nothing. A newspaper article 11 years later described the cost associated with paying out insurance claims on lost ships, described the Queen of the Isle as having 96 men on board that were lost, James Arbuckle being one of those men. And so this one, <laughs> I, deb I debated on not including this one, but it, it, it's, and you might be wondering, how does Versailles fit <laughs> into Washingtonville? And Bit, it does give historical con context, so uh, here we go. Be, be prepared for this one. This one's a stretch. But um, 18, or 1686 was pronounced the year of the fistula in France due to the immense relief of King Louis XIV's terrible suffering. Um, does anybody know what a fistula is? Anybody in medical field? Okay, we're going to go down that road. <laughs> if you don't know what a fistula in ano is, let me give you the medical definition to be proper. An anal fistula... <laughs> is the infection tunnel between the skin and the anus. Most anal fistulas are the result of an infection in an anal gland that spreads to the skin. Symptoms include pain, swelling, discharge of pus or blood from the anus. Surgery is usually needed to treat an anal fistula. Thank you, Dr. Google. <laughs> so back to King Louis. He had a really, really big problem. He had a fistula and he'd been suffering for absolutely months on end. The doctors were treating him and just remember, it's 1686. They do things so much differently. They had compresses soaked with extracts with various leaves and roses cooked in burgundy wine. They injected the cavity with various um, substances. They had red hot irons that they stuck in the wound to try and cauterize it. And they said they actually made the skin and the wound worse because then that would eat away and make it bigger. So they just kept feeding the problem. Um, it kept leaking blood and pus so much that he had to change his clothing several times a day. And finally, he got so tired of his own physicians, he said, I want a surgeon and I want surgery and I want it now. The problem was nobody wanted to operate on the king because if you accidentally killed him, that was the end of you, <laughs> let alone your career, you know. Um, but in the end, they finally found a surgeon who was a famed surgeon and they brought him to Versailles. He approached the king and he said, I will do it. I will attempt it, but I need four months. And they're like, why do you need four months? And he's like, I want to practice. They're like, who are you going to practice on? He went to the insane asylums because who was there? Vagrants. He went to the jail. Who were there? Vagrants. People nobody wanted. And he found people who had wounds similar to the king and he operated on them and all the time, not successful. So he practiced and he practiced for four months. He made a special scapula. And if you go to the Versailles website, you can actually see the scapula that was used on King Louis. So he comes back. Uh, he comes back and the, the doctor was successful and he, he was able to remove that. And, and within two months, Louis was back in the saddle again, quite literally riding again and um, back to his good thing. But they called it 
the year of the fistula because after he was successful, he was given all these awards and given all this money. He was given a land and he got all these, you know, laurels from the king. Well, the people at Versailles all of a sudden had all kinds of butt problems and they couldn't wait to show the good doctor their backside. He was actually turning people away. And he's like, you know, we, that's why they call it the year of the fish job. So what does that have to do with Washingtonville? You might be wondering, and I'm getting there, I promise you. Um, while filling out the VA application for Corporal Z Zeta Ben Dusenberry, I had to order his pension file from the National Archives. And in it, he describes and provides documentation onto why and how he was injured. And in this case, it says fistula and anno it, by a by injury of a fall near Falmouth, uh, Virginia on December 1st, 1862. Fistula and anno was the same thing as what King Louis had. Ouch. And ouch indeed. So on December 1st, 1862, Corporal Zeno Dusenberry was on a skirmish line when he fell into the brush and into the works. And, I mean, and his um, Lieutenant Colonel there said he injured himself, his person near the rectum. Um, that must have been some fall. And indeed you can get an anal fistula from Crohn's disease and infection in the area, surgery, radiation, um, a previously drained abscess that comes back, or in the case of xenophen, uh, trauma. So that's how he got that. But there was another factor for Zeno, <clears throat> and it's found on his discharge papers. Zeno's enlistment papers show that he was 40 years old when he enlisted. But in reality, as his Colonel Ellis uh, writes here, Zeno is now 52 years of age. That means he's no spring chicken, right? And being that I'm 48, I hate to say that, <laughs> 52 is just right around the corner and not spring chicken. Uh, but the Colonel writes that he is incapable of performing duties of a soldier because of his fistula and anno and infirmary arising from his age. Um, so perhaps he's just not healing as quickly because he's not a young person anymore. In fact, he was in the hospital from December to March when he was released. So that says something there about the, the size and the depth of the injury that he was suffering. Um, you might be asking yourself, why didn't he have the same surgery as King Louis then? Um, because you're in the military and you're talking about camp, su camp surgeons who were more, you know, suited to butcher hogs than to really operate on a delicate, you know, genital area than, than anybody. So um, it really wasn't a popular surgery either. Um, it wasn't a common thing. And if they weren't doing it in 1862, they sure, you know, they weren't, they weren't doing it in, you know, King Louis's time, they still weren't doing it 200 years later for Zeno. So he got sent home and I doubt he found anybody to uh, do that. So, and I say that because in his pension file, he filed his pension uh, just a few months or a few years sorry, before he died, and he made no mention of having that surgery performed to relieve it. Um, and normally he would have because you have to list different things that you've done. Um, so he does pass away. And they note here that he said he was a great sufferer of rheumatism being the chief reply or the chief cause. Sorry. And I bet it probably did look like rheumatism because if you're shuffling along because it hurts to walk, you probably did end up having back problems or hip problems. King Louis was in so much pain that he got to ride around in Shays Lounge. Somebody was carrying him everywhere he went. Uh, Zeno didn't have that luxury that King Louis did. So um, I'm sure Zeno did suffer from rheumatism and arthritis and everything else. He was in a lot of pain. Um, Zeno doesn't have a headstone, but it's currently being produced in Louisiana as we speak, and it'll be here within the month. Um, it's going to be placed next to his son, Henry, uh, who also served in the Civil War as well. So. All right, next we're going to take a jaunt into my own family tree for a second. I have this great aunt here named Emma Herman, and she has just the most interesting life, I think. I could write a book on her alone, but her death in, is just in line with how she lived. It was just very strange. Um, Emma divorced her first husband who was very abusive to her and he drank a lot and he was just a real cad. Um, he, she took her young children and she left and she tried to raise them on her own. She worked as a laundress and she just was making pennies. Somewhere along the line, she was a German immigrant. She marries him, but she put her kids into the, the children's home the day before she marries this man. I don't know if that was an agreement they made. He didn't want to raise children or what, but she marries this man and gets rid of her children. Um, within a few months, though, she leaves this guy and goes to stay with her friend. The German immigrant husband comes to the house where she's staying with a friend, drinks carbolic acid in front of the door, and drops dead. So now my aunt is single and widowed. Well, she's back out on the town again, and she's catting around. And she goes, if you look on the, 
the death mention over there, it says that she died at a lumber camp. What's she doing at a lumber camp? Um, she's out catting around looking for a man. And the, that night, there happened to be one of the largest storms that ever ran through central Ohio, came through that night, and lightning hit a tree, bounced off, and hit her, and she died of shock. Um, so that just, that's the tale there. Don't go catting around where you're not supposed to be when it's got a thunderstorm. Um, but I wanted to just talk about that just briefly to segue into, uh, Orange County is no stranger to dangerous lightning events as well. Um, and in these little brief articles, and there are so many, I could just pepper that whole screen with stories. You can see cows, horses, chickens, barns, or prime targets, but people like my aunt were also victims as well. And, um, in July 1868, a large storm front rolled through Blooming Grove and did massive jam massive damage. And if you just read that whole thing, I mean, it talks about all the damage, but I have the one I'm gonna talk about circled. Um, not only were barns and wagons hit, but this storm took out several people, including the wife and two children of James Wade, who was one of the black soldiers of the US 20, um, the 20th uh, Regiment at our cemetery. Um, James would go on to marry again and have other children, but it really illustrates the dangers in our area about the storms that could run through. And the article, I was kind of tongue in cheek there, um, concludes by encouraging everyone to install lightning rods to protect your wives, your children, and your property. <laughs> like, kind of thanks, you know, like we didn't know that now. Um, so now we're going to take a jaunt over to Austria. You didn't know you were going around the world with this one, did you? <laughs> Sorry, uh, we're going to take a drive over to Austria to talk about the dangers of carbon monoxide poisoning. And just to show you that it doesn't matter how rich or famous you are, bad things can and do happen to you, even if you're a crown prince. And on Christmas Eve, um, what year was this? Oh, 1842. Uh, prince Albrecht of Austria and his wife went to bed, but they never woke up. Their coal stove had been faulty and all the gas from their stove poured into their bedroom and they were discovered the next morning dead. Um, had they been awake, maybe they might have been able to notice some of the funky side effects that come from carbon monoxide poisoning. But when you're asleep, you don't notice that you feel dizzy or you feel off or you're stuttering or, you know, you just don't know. That's why we need carbon monoxide poisoning uh, detectors today. And if you've ever wondered why miners use canaries in cages, as I have, because I'm a genealogist and my family were miners in Kentucky, <laughs> um, I went digging into that as well. And so the um, canaries have this weird little pouch in their chest that when they breathe in, they of course take in oxygen, but when they breathe out, they also somehow breathe in oxygen and store it in that pouch as well. So as opposed to having a rat or a mouse or even a rabbit in a cage, canaries are preferred because they're taking in double the oxygen and actually alert you faster to carbon monoxide poisoning. So I don't know if anybody ever knew that, but that's the story about uh, canaries in cages. So miners usually adored their birds, they would give them pet names, and they took really good care of them, because in this case, they really were lifesavers. So they, they really enjoyed their canaries in the cages. But much like the Austrian prince in January of 1890, Miss Anna, uh, Anna Eliza Conklin, went to bed and unfortunately never woke up having died in her sleep from the effects of carbon monoxide poisoning from a clogged flu that was in her room. Anna Eliza was a nurse and had a very difficult life. Her husband was in the Civil War. He deserted and he came home and they caught him in Chester where he was reportedly captured and sent to prison. And he was reportedly from his family, his, his living family has told me, um, he was so embarrassed about being caught and being sent back. He thought that he dishonored her and his boys um, that he never came home. He supposedly went out West and left her with all the children. I thought, well, <laughs> that's kind of a weird way to say I'm sorry, but um, he did. Um, but speaking of children, being a child is dangerous business, and especially in this area. There are so many articles of children drowning after being swept away or falling through ice. Um, there was one that happened behind the cemetery. There was a child who's flipped through the ice at going home from school, thought he could skip across it, didn't, and he was swept away. Um, there are multiple farm accidents and children trying to jump on trains. One of the kids lost their leg trying to jump on a train. The kids are just, being a kid in this area was very dangerous. And um, prior to living in the funeral home, in my younger years, I we lived out in the country and we had a very steep hill and we used to go sledding all the time. And I never thought for a minute, 
about sliding into the neighbor across from us, his field had a barbed wire fence. It never even crossed my mind that I might get tangled up in that fence or we crossed the road, you know, with a car going to come and hit us and just never, never crossed my mind. But now that I have a six-year-old granddaughter, I think about these things. I'm like, oh no, don't do that. You know, your mind as a kid, you just don't think about these things. Um, and I worry about these things, but this tragic childhood tale I'm about to tell you is one that just breaks your heart into a million pieces because you can't imagine what these parents went through. Um, at least I don't. So uh, here's the here's the little tiny blurb, but it gets much worse. So Edward David was Edward Davis, sorry, was 14 years old and the son of Dr. Edward and Leona Davis. And this little article, you think, oh, how terrible. He was sledding and having some accident. No, no, no. It gets much worse. So Edward had broken his neck 12 years earlier. So when he was at two and on New Year's Eve, he somehow broke his accident and um, broke his neck in that accident. And he'd been unable to speak since that accident. And for the most part, he went deaf as well. Um, his parents said he was just starting to get his hearing back when the sledding accident happened. Um, and if that's not enough, on the day of his death, Edward was with his friends and they were sliding and he goes down first. And as he's nearing the end of this really steep slope, his sled turns sideways and he slows down. His friend that had launched behind him was going straight and was picking up speed and crashed into it. So Edward's sideways and this guy comes and plows sideways right into the side of him. Edward goes tumbling and lands into a, and ends up in the yard. And so they all go rushing over to Edward to see it. And he looks fine. They said, oh, he's just got like, you know, bruise on his leg. He's got a couple of cuts on his face from the snow. But he's, he's like out. They couldn't wake him up. They're shaking him like, Edward, wake up, wake up. Can't wake him up. So his dad's a doctor. So they run to the house to get the dad. Dad comes back and he can't wake him up either. He had died from a heart attack. Basically his heart quit from shock. So here's your son who's went through all that stuff, broke his neck, lost his hearing, can't speak. And now he's in just this stupid childhood accident and now he's dead. So that is, that's just a terrible, terrible tale. And that was right here uh, down the road. So my final tale for tonight before I turn it over to, to Matt is a very short one and to the point. Um, there really isn't much to reveal here as it's just very straightforward, but it's shocking all the same. Uh, Mr. George Ashley was walking home and it's just past 1030 at night. And so it's dark and he stumbled and he fell into an open well somewhere past the train depot and down the tracks a little bit. Why is there an open hole that has a well? Why did they put rocks around? I don't know. Um, but he fell into this open well. Someone later comes along to get water and they see feet bobbing in the water. So he had fell, fallen head first into the water. So the coroner was called because when they pulled him out, he had all kinds of cuts and scrapes above his head. And they thought somebody had maybe done something bad to him and that was murder. So um, the coroner ruled in an accidental drowning, but the whole town got into a great big tizzy and demanded another inquest. And But they said it was an accidental death. So, but that is, that's quite shocking I think, for this area. So that is my time, but I do have one more little slide. If you want to find out more about the cemetery and our history and more of the inhabitants stories, I do blog about them. Um, we have upcoming programming and we have volunteer opportunities. You can find out more about us uh, right there. We have Facebook as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Sorry.